Welcome to Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. The only podcast where it's okay to talk in band. On this podcast, you will be able to hear conversations with some of the greatest names in wind band conducting, composing, and arranging. We'll also visit with great college, high school, middle school, and elementary band directors to get their thoughts on various aspects of being a band director. We'll have regular check-ins with instrument specialists, music dealers, and instrument repair professionals. And if that's not enough, we'll even have regular conversations with Dr. Tim, who will help keep us motivated. That's Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. And now, here's Charlie. Welcome to Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends and this podcast number 41. Well, for those of you keeping track, this is our second podcast of our second season. It's hard to believe that a year's passed since I undertook this pastime, but it sure has been fun. I've had the wonderful opportunity to share with you, our listeners, some incredible conversations. And today, I have another one. You're going to hear a conversation with director of bands at Boise State University in Boise, Idaho, and one of the great people in our profession, Marcellus Brown. You'll learn how a young man who grew up playing the trumpet in Detroit ended up in Boise, Idaho. Marcellus has some wonderful stories to share with you, and you're going to hear them in just a minute. This is Drew with thepodcastingstore.com, your one-stop shop for everything podcasting and remote learning, and a proud sponsor of Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. Listen to what we've been working on in this clip from our podcast. We have been preparing for the Colorado Music Educators Association virtual conference coming up starting January 27th. Because it's a virtual conference, we wanted to highlight how remote teachers can combine some easy-to-use equipment with the smartphone they already have to make some great video content. To do this, we partnered with The Mayor of Old Town, a restaurant here in Fort Collins, Colorado, known nationwide for their incredible selection of beer. We wanted to highlight the exceptional food also available at The Mayor, so we created two cooking shows using the Galaxy GTV wireless system and our smartphones. If you're attending the conference, there are two things for you to know. One, our own Charlie Mangini will be presenting a session with Don Stinson on podcasting and the virtual director. We are proud to be sponsoring this must-attend seminar. And two... You will have an opportunity to win one of the Galaxy Wireless Systems when you attend our vendor evening session. Time and date will be announced soon. But if you're not going to be there, you can still win one. Just go to our website, thepodcastingstore.com, and sign up for our e-newsletter. If you do that by January 27th, 2021, you will be entered to win. That's it. The winner will be randomly selected from all the subscribers to our list and will be contacted at the address provided following the conclusion of the conference. Visit thepodcastingstore.com, your one-stop shop for everything podcasting and remote learning. This is Drew with thepodcastingstore.com. Now back to Charlie. Before I get to my conversation with Marcellus Brown, I want to take a couple of minutes to share some thoughts with you. Last week, I completed an article for the upcoming edition of School Band and Orchestra magazine. That article is titled, Preparing to Teach in a Post-Pandemic World. And the intention of the article is to get directors thinking about getting back to a more normal school experience. I touched upon three major points, but I want to focus on just one of them for this podcast. And that is that your program starts with beginners. Whether you teach at the university level, high school, middle school, or grade school, every single musician in your group had to start somewhere and had to start at some time. During the pandemic, I've heard countless stories of districts that did not start beginners this year or schools that started them virtually or perhaps in some sort of hybrid teaching situation. And when I hear about all of this, alarm bells go off in my head as I think about all that has been glossed. Regardless of what your school district did this year, when you get back to some sense of normalcy, make the highest priority in your program, the attention and the instruction that your beginning students are getting. Every effort must be made to help them develop the skills and to help them cultivate the attitude 
that is so important to being successful playing an instrument and remaining as a member of your school band program. If you can provide private or small group lessons, do it. And make sure they're fun. Make learning an instrument fun. Praise every one of those behaviors you want to cultivate. If you like the way they took the instrument out of the case, tell them. If you like how they set up their music book and pencil on the music stand, tell them. If you like their posture, their hand position, tell them. When they make those wonderful sounds, make sure you use the word and and not but. Say, that was good and instead of that was good but. Use language that continues to focus on the goal, that continues to raise the bar. Once you get them started, communicate. Let their parents know how well that child is doing. Let the classroom teacher know how well their students are doing. Let the principal know how well those students are doing. Set up some short show-and-tell performances for parents. 20 minutes, in and out the door. Play a couple of lines from the method book. Do this with small groups. That even works better. Let everyone know that you're going to be selecting 8 to 10 students a week for a special performance. And over the course of a month or two, every student will have had their special performance time. Let the students be the stars of this time. They can introduce each line they play in the book. They can say what they like best about being in band. They can demonstrate what good posture and good hand position is, what good tone sounds like. Just be creative and don't try to overthink it. When they are done, compliment them in front of their parents and compliment the parents in front of the students. Then have some cookies and soft drinks and everyone goes home. You don't need a gymnasium full of chairs and people. This can happen right in the normal room where you have band or maybe the school cafeteria or library or wherever. The point is you have to focus energy on those beginners. Think through it now so that when you get the all clear signal from your school district, you're going to be ready to go. We'll be back with my conversation with Marcellus Brown right after this. Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends is made possible through the support of Hal Leonard, publisher of the Essential Elements Method for Band. Advantage Network Percussion, where you only get the advantage if you're part of the network. Thepodcastingstore.com, your one-stop shop for the finest in podcasting and virtual learning gear. And Vandercook College of Music, home of the Mecca Continuing Education Program, where you'll find an online class for your every need. I was director of bands at Vandercook College of Music for 23 years. And during that time, I developed a ritual. Well, I didn't develop a ritual. My buddy Gary Green developed a ritual that on Saturday afternoon, after the Midwest had been put away and all the blue vests went home, I'd head back to where I lived and change clothes and got into a pair of jeans and a comfortable shirt, and I'd head downtown Chicago, get on Wabash Avenue and go to this old building and go up this rickety old set of stairs into this smoke-filled cavern. And it was the Ewan Reese Cigar Store, one of the great cigar stores in the world. And I'd go in there and buy me a fine cigar and Gary, meet Gary there. And we'd go into this, this room that they had off the side and go enjoy a cigar. And the, I guess it was probably the first or second time I ever did this. I walk in and Lo and behold, there's this distinguished gentleman sitting there, and he's enjoying a fine Maduro. And uh, Gary says, hey, Marcellus, how are you? And I went like, oh, my God, is that Marcellus Brown? And Gary goes, yeah. And I said, man, I've never met him. I want to meet him. Introduce me to him, Gary. So Gary introduced me to him. And the next thing we know, we're buddies. We're cigar-smoking buddies. And I'm, I'm just so honored that my buddy Marcellus Brown from Boise State University is going to join us on the podcast. Marcellus, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the kind words. It was my pleasure to have met you, by the way. Oh, no, no. Quite good. Hey, are you still smoking those things, by the way? I periodically will go do that thing. It's a, a, one of the pleasures in life or the sinful pleasures in life that I certainly enjoy. Okay, well, I, I had to stop after I had my heart attack. So enjoy one for me next time because I still love the aroma. But, I, but you know, I, I have to be a little bit careful of that. Well, buddy, it, it's been almost a year since the last time we were together in Boise. We were judging a high school band festival and the world was starting to get all worked up over COVID. And uh, 
we knew the virus was making an appearance, but we had no idea at the time the magnitude it was going to have on the world. And more importantly for our listeners, the magnitude it was going to have on music and music education. Um, talk, talk to me a little bit about, about that this time through for you, what, what you've experienced. Well, there have been some challenges. I actually ended up getting COVID. Uh, it was shared to me by an extended family member uh, just after Thanksgiving. I've managed to get out of it actually with not being too sick. There were about four or five days where I just felt terrible. And uh, the recovery for me has been, I've just been tired or not as much energy for a number of weeks, but I'm COVID free and I'm healthy uh, and uh, thankful that I'm at this place right now. So how did it impact the college and the university and music education around uh, the Boise area? Well, uh, in a number of different ways, it has affected me and what I do uh, from the standpoint that we have to rehearse 10 feet apart. We have bags over the instruments. I have to rehearse with a mask or a shield. And uh, the whole concept or idea of having an ensemble and making music has become much harder. The only place that we can rehearse where there's enough space where we safely can rehearse is on the main stage or on our main hall stage. It's a huge stage. It's a beautiful uh, auditorium. Uh, if any of you have been to the Craner Hall at uh, the University of Illinois, or um, it, it's considered to be one of the top 100 concert halls in the United States. So lots of space. Major shows and productions come through uh, on a regular basis, but that's the only place we can rehearse. And this past semester, I only had uh, one 30 minute rehearsal uh, a week. Uh, and the other times we rehearsed in small groups, sectionals or small groups of no larger than 20. Uh, and we did do a concert, but it was it, there were some real challenges. And uh, this coming semester, it's going to be better because I can rehearse three days a week and I'll be able to rehearse for a little more than an hour because of the air exchanges, exchanges that they have in the hall and uh, the size of the hall. So there have been some improvements, but still bags over the instruments, still space 10 feet apart. Still, I'm going to have a plastic uh, covering over my face uh, and... Um, it's, it won't be as good or as rewarding as it has been in the past when we're able to be closer together. Yeah. It's the week. And we're thankful that we can rehearse because there are a lot of schools that just can't rehearse. They just don't have the space to rehearse. Yeah. Have you had any lasting uh, side effects from having COVID? Uh, I have a dry cough that just seems that it won't go away. And then, uh, as I said earlier, I, I can get tired and I just don't remember being that kind of tired. Uh, and uh, it's, one of the side effects that I've read about, and I'm sure that's what it is. And I'm a, I'm a busy guy. I'm up early and up late, uh, but it's become harder to do that. Well, lay off those cigars until you're back to normal. That's what I'm going to tell you. All right. So let's get to the important stuff, Marcellus. You grew up in Detroit, Michigan, the Detroit area, I guess. So tell us about when music was introduced to you in your life and when you started playing the trumpet and some memories you may have had from those early years of playing in band. Well, this is pretty interesting, or I don't know if interesting, but a colorful story. Uh, I started playing an elementary uh, band in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, I went to Peck Elementary School. My first band director was a string person. His name was Anderson White. Uh, he had gone to the University of Michigan and was a young teacher. And I was in his program and I picked trumpet because it only had three buttons and it didn't look as complicated as the clarinet. <laughs> so um, here I was on trumpet and uh, Andy, who actually was a part of my life, uh, my musical life, all the way through high school and college. But uh, he went on to teach at high school in the area. He had a community orchestra that I played in. He ran a summer community uh, jazz ensemble. And of the many things that he had us do, he would get kids together uh, with parents and to make sure that we played at the state, uh, at the district solo festival and the state solo festival. And I'm gonna come back to that later uh, at some point or another. But we had to do it uh, on a regular basis. Uh, I did it from uh, uh, junior high all the way through high school. Uh, priceless experiences for me. Uh, junior high, I had a band director named Mr. Clock. I don't remember his first name. But what I do remember is that he was always well organized. He, he wore a shirt tie and a jacket to work every day and had beautiful cuff marks. Uh, but... Uh, this image that he had was you come in, you get your instrument, we had to go stand in front of a tuner and check our own pitch, you sit down, he told us how to warm up, we had a warm up routine that we went through that he insisted we played musically and 
did our very best to play in tune and he affected me uh, or showed me how at least that routine and discipline could help you uh, grow and get better. Uh, left there and went to uh, Cass Tech High School, which at the time was considered to be one of the top high school uh, music programs in the country. And uh, I had the good fortune, the director there was Harold Arnaldi, uh, but prior to Harold Arnaldi being there, uh, Harry Beecham was the director of that program and was really the spark or the, the, the person who generated and made that program very special. He left there, went to uh, Wayne State University, taught at Michigan State, and ended his career at the University of Illinois, where he is, is absolutely one of the icons in our business. Um, so uh, that's basically what happened in high school, with the exception of one year when I was a junior. My dad was in the military, and uh, I left uh, the city of Detroit and went to Germany and played in the, the Munich American High School Band and came across a fabulous music teacher who the level of performance in that group was not as high or as strong as it was at Cass Tech, but I was exposed to opera. I went to orchestra concerts. I heard Maurice Andre, who was one of the, one of the great trumpet players of all time, uh, play live numerous times. Um, I, there was a jazz club called the Domicile that had a reading band that uh, once a month would rehearse and you could come come in and play with them. I didn't play a lot, but several times I got, I was able to sit in with a reading band. I'd go to the Hofbrauer house and uh, I played a couple times, uh, subbed and played in a polka band in the Hofbrauer house. Uh, and I will tell you that uh, I was 18, legal to drink, uh, but I didn't drink. And the mayor of the city uh, bought the band beers and beers come in a liter container or a liter mug. And they slid the the beer underneath my seat and the guy sitting next to me, the German guy said, uh, if, even if you don't drink, you have to drink some of it. So I drank some of the beer, it got warm, they took it away, they slid another one. And he said, just take a little bit. Man, on my way home that night and when I finally get, got to home, got in my bed, it was all I could do to stop the bed from spinning. So <laughs> that was my first experience. And well, hopefully, well, it's my first experience and only one like that that uh, with alcohol that uh, was most unpleasant. So, uh, but my experiences in Germany and with a group of guys that were absolutely music nuts uh, was, was priceless, was priceless. So uh, from elementary school through uh, high school, uh, I had uh, teachers that I think were passionate. I had teachers that were fine musicians. I had teachers that were caring. I had teachers that were demanding uh, and expected excellence. And I think those are the things and those are the kinds of things that, that have helped me be as successful as I am now. And those are the kinds of things that the audience or the people that are listening uh, will also, I'm sure you need to remember, share and keep those things as you go out and work in our business. So you, you come back from Germany, you graduate from high school in, in the States at Wayne State, or at, uh, I'm sorry, Cash Tech. And, and Harry Beecham's at Wayne State, uh, but you decide to go to the University of Michigan to be a trumpet performance major. So, man, talk about early memories of being a young, uh, young man going to the University of Michigan and being a trumpet performance major. Well, let's go back to, again, my elementary band director, who I told you, Anderson White, Andy White, who took us to state and solo contests uh, and had us go play uh, every year. And so uh, my senior year, I played a movement from the Haydn Trumpet Concerto at the state solo contest. And I had applied to two schools. I had applied to Winston-Salem State College uh, in uh, North Carolina, or South North Carolina. And then I also applied to the University of Michigan. Um, got a Winston-Salem State College had come through recruiting when I was a junior and said, look, if you want to come to school here, we like the way you play. We will give you a full ride plus a round trip Greyhound ticket from your house to our college once a year. And I said, boy, that's really nice. And I was set. I applied to Michigan. Michigan said, well, we'll accept you, but you can't come until second semester because we don't have any room. There were 30 or 30 plus trumpet majors, and there just wasn't room for you to come study there. It happened to work out that the trumpet 
adjudicator that I played for at the state contest was Clifford Lillier. And Clifford Lillier was a professor of trumpet at the University of Michigan. So Andy White or Anderson White, who had gone to Michigan, called Clifford Lillier and said, do you remember that black trumpet player uh, that played for you at state solo contest? He's applied, he's been accepted, but if, if something isn't worked out so that he can't be there in the fall, he's gonna go to Winston-Salem State College. My dad was real clear that you're gonna go to college or you're gonna work. And uh, I definitely wanted to go to college. They wanted me to go to college, but if that, that, that didn't happen, I wasn't gonna spend a, a semester or however many months at home not doing anything. So if I worked, I'd have been working at Ford or General Motors because the money was good and they were hiring. But it happened to work out that it, because of that teacher and because of what he had done, and because of those connections, I did get in Michigan in the fall of 1969. Wow. So, and, and to be clear, H, uh, uh, Winston-Salem College was a historically black college and university, correct? That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and Clifford Lilia is one of the icons uh, in, in music education and, and, and trumpet teaching. I mean, my gosh, just, he's got some old tie-ins with the old H.E. Nutt and all those guys in Chicago, too, Clifford Lilia does. He was at Vandercook. Clifford Lilia, uh, he taught in Chicago and had a very close relationship with the teachers and programs uh, at uh, Vandercook. But he subbed, I believe, subbed and did some work with the Chicago Symphony. And he has, he has trumpet students of his that have played in, in, that are playing in major orchestras or that have played in major orchestras and countless students that have played in the top military bands. Fabulous teacher, but more important than being a fabulous teacher, he was a fabulous human being. Uh, and I may talk about this later, but I'll just stick in that he came to concerts and listened to his play. And after every performance, he would come in and sometimes you, if you felt you didn't play well, he could always find something good in everything we did. All, even in lesson, he would correct you. You need to fix that, but he or this needs to be done. But he could always find positive or something positive in everything that we did. And again, I remember him for that uh, as much as anything. Yeah, the mark of a great teacher, isn't it? So at what point along the way did you say, well, you know what? I think I'd rather be a band director than being a, a principal trumpet player in the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, huh? I don't know if that was going to happen, but uh, I do know that um, I was there, and it was my junior year, I believe. And there was a there was always a student conductor of the pet band, and um, I wanted to do some conducting, and I thought it'd be really fun to do the pet band. And so I went up to Ravelli, who was a matter of fact, my sophomore, went up to Ravelli and said or asked him, "Can I be the student director of the pet band next year?" And uh, Ravelli uh, said, mm, uh, it's possible. And then the student directors that worked it before, they generally were, they went and got music or they helped. Everything was done with flip folders in the pep band. So if Ravelli needed the music, you could see a student conductor holding the flip folder. And he didn't do a lot of conducting. And I told him I wanted to conduct. And he said, okay, you can conduct. But if your work isn't good, I'm taking you out of that you will not be able to conduct. So the first game I go to and, and uh, the first thing, real thing, we played before the game, but the first real thing that I did that everybody listened to was the national anthem. And uh, we did the national anthem and uh, it was too slow. It was way too slow. <laughs> so Ravelli comes up to me and says, you understand this is the national anthem and it is our national song and you have to know tempos and you have to know it and be able to do it better than you did it at this last event. So he said, on your way out to the Rose Bowl, the band, marching band was going to the Rose Bowl, I want you to come see me and sing all the parts and conduct the national anthem to me in the plane. Was he that calm when he said that to you? Not or, really. or was he a little bit more intense? <laughs> it was intense. You know, this, <laughs> and, uh, it, and it was basically, if you don't come in and do this well, you're, you're done. And uh, the, the intenseness for me didn't bother me. Um, and it didn't bother me because I'll go back to my experience uh, in high school. Uh, at Cass Tech, it was competitive. You have to play on a regular basis, your parts. Um, and once a week, you had a sectional in the morning at this high school uh, program. So the matter of showing up and doing what it is that you worked on was not a big deal. Now, I will tell you, I was a little nervous. So I'm in the back of the plane singing parts 
and wave a Mongatan to the national anthem. And uh, coming in saying there's a right temple, there's not, there's a certain temple, it's gotta be here to here. You have to know the parts. You don't need to know how the parts fit together uh, and how one part affects the other. And uh, so that was my jump off into conducting. But the experience, the connection between what I did and the audience was what turned me on. That I was able to make music or create something and it not only affected me, but the players, but the audience too, I could say something. And that was the book. Uh, and from there, it went on to um, everything from Lincoln Shire Posey to Irish team from County Derry to uh, you name it. Obviously, book, you weren't playing those with the pet band. <laughs> uh, no, as a matter of fact, the, the pet band, we were playing pop tunes. Uh, they were pop tunes sure. that weren't very good. Uh, so I listed a couple of my buddies, one Jim Hines, who's a a very well-known composer, uh, and uh, and Jim Colonel was the other one, uh, and they did some pop arrangements of tunes that you heard on the radio. And uh, of course, they changed them enough to be copyright compliant, correct? Well, of course. Oh yeah, they were. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but they did those tunes. But what I had to do was learn how to teach those tunes or get the pet band to sound like the tunes on the radio. Yeah. And that was the challenge for me. Did you ever get a chance to study with uh, Elizabeth Green? Uh, she was my conducting teacher. Oh, wow. How's was, that? It was fabulous. She was a terrific teacher, meticulous, thoughtful. And she, although was so kind and gentle, but this is the way you do it. This is the way you need to do it. And this is how you have to do it. And these are the kinds of things uh, that need to be done. I remember telling her I came into a lesson and wasn't as prepared as I should have been and try to explain to her why that I was playing in a group over the weekend and we were making money and I'm making money to go to college and kind of hours. And she said, if you're going to be a student, then you have to put in the requisite type of work and hours to be a student because that's your full-time job. And if you need to do something so you get more sleep so that you can function at the proper level, then that's what you do. She was, she was wonderful, but she was tough. Iron fist. That's awesome. So you graduate from the University of Michigan. What's the next step for Marcellus Brown? I needed a job and um, I interviewed really at two, only two schools, uh, the University of Kansas and the other school was Chicago State University. And the University of Kansas gig was wrong gig for me. You know how I was wrong job. You know how you, you, you can't see around a corner and you think this is what I want to do. The University of Kansas is a great school. They wanted me to come there and uh, be one of the uh, uh, administrators for their huge summer music program and conduct one of the bands. And I don't know, they must have had four or five conductors, the, the main person, right? The, uh, other groups. And uh, that would have involved me really dealing with setting up, running, doing things for, this, for the summer camp. Uh, and if Johnny or Mary got caught doing, Johnny and Sally uh, got caught doing something they weren't supposed to be doing in a room together or dealing with a controlled substance, then I'm going to have to call their parents, talk to them, and send Johnny and Mary home. And that just wasn't what I needed to be doing at that point in time. So I got hired at Chicago State University, uh, showed up there, and had all these tools from the university. What does a symphonic band sound like? How do you rehearse a group? Could you conduct? Yes, I had uh, conducting chops. And showed up there and tried to I had my first rehearsal and it sounded nothing <laughs> like anything at the University of Michigan. And uh, I had to learn how to teach. And I had some fabulous musicians. There were guys in, that were coming back or working on degrees at Chicago State who uh, had been in the Basie band or guys who had played with Ellington, uh, the Ellington band, although they, it was Ellington band a couple of generations removed. There were guys that were working and playing in salsa bands around town and gigging. But to get that group to play with the kind of blend and balance in the ensemble that you need to have a wind ensemble or a concert band, it was foreign to them because of what they, what they were used to doing and the kind of music that uh, they were playing to make money with. And so I had to learn how or teach them how to do it. Now, I'll never forget my uh, first year there. We um, couldn't prepare an hour concert to just and play it at the quality of the level that I felt it should have been. So I decided that this concert was, a, I think, early December. So I decided that uh, I would put together a brass quartet 
And before the concert on uh, co the concert band came out, the brass quartet would play 15 minutes of uh, or so of Christmas carols. I would be in the quartet and I'd pick three other students. And we sat down a couple of weeks before the concert to play the quartets. And it's basically like playing hymns out of a hymnal. And guys were putting T's on the ends of the notes. Uh, <laughs> the vibratos didn't match. Uh, the sound and quality of the sounds, just it was not a quartet sound. I'm telling you, I had to figure out how to make this stuff work and how they could listen across and teach them a different way of doing this music. And it's not what they were doing was wrong. It would work if you were playing, I guess, in the salsa band or if you're in a big band. But it was entirely an entirely different thing for them to do that in that setting. They were the, they were the Christmas carols out of the Rasmussen book. And uh, so the thing that was fabulous about Chicago State, it forced me to learn how to teach, but how to teach at a level and the kinds of things that they didn't talk about at the University of Michigan. And that same kind of teaching is the same kind of teaching that you have to do to do if you're teaching kids in a rural area or that are from small towns. Uh, it's one thing if you're from Chicago or if you're from uh, uh, Detroit metropolitan area or from LA or from Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota. But there's another kind of teaching that uh, you have to know how to do, uh, that you have to learn how to do and you have to learn how to do that by rolling up your sleeves and getting in there and, and working at it. So how long were you at Chicago State? Six or seven years. Yeah. We left there and went to Augustana College, which was, a, they had a really good band program there, a uh, choral program, Augustana in uh, Rock Island, Illinois. There are two Augustanas. Uh, and it was a good experience, but I just was wearing too many hats. Uh, Augustana College was a Division three school, and they were always in the... Uh, Alonzo Stag Bowl, the football team was playing championship, the basketball team was playing championship. So I had to have a pep band for uh, all the basketball games, for all the football games. Um, I uh, taught brass methods. Um, of course, I taught trumpet, but uh, I also uh, taught, at, at some point or another, I taught horn, I taught some trombone, I taught some tuba. Uh, there were two concert bands that I was running. Uh, and I was, it, I was all over the place. And I was doing some work in Chicago, playing-wise, a lot of work with a brass quartet that I had in town and uh, playing extra with the Davenport uh, uh, Symphony Orchestra. And uh, I was just too many things, doing too many things and trying to raise a family. And I said, I need to move to a place where it was more focused and less things to do. And uh, at that time, uh, or during part of that time, I decided to... Uh, began to work, work on a doctorate at the University uh, of Illinois, to which uh, Harry Beechin was the director of bands there. Um, and uh, my work there uh, at Augustana went on for again, six years or so, but then um, I decided to try move to, uh, at Augustana, I tried to move to a place that was less involved, fewer hats. And that's how I ended up at Boise State University. Yeah, so, you know, the, I mean, the legend still in Chicago is that Chicago State's never had a band program anywhere close to when, like when you were there. I mean, it, it just has never come back to that level of proficiency uh, that you had it. Uh, but let's get back to, so, so you go to Illinois for your doctorate. How was studying at Illinois, now, you're old, obviously you're older, you got some more experience under your belt, but how was studying at Illinois different than studying at the University of Michigan? Well, um, at the University of Michigan, I was young and I was taking things in and I was trying to be the best that I could be. There was no mistake. I wanted to be the best trumpet player. I wanted to be the best whatever it was that I was doing. But I, that was a place where I learned how to do things and I grew to the point where when I finally got to the you know, Illinois, University of Illinois, I had questions. I wanted to know, I had, could come in with, I want to know how to do, to do this better. I was a performance major. Trumpet performance major with a minor in conducting. Uh, and the beauty of that, I studied with David Hickman, who was one of the great trumpet teachers of our time. But Hickman was a fabulous teacher. He just told me what I needed to do. And I went to work and showed up. And uh, he exposed me and gave me experiences that were just terrific. But the real gem of that was spending time with Harry Beejan. And um, I was, when I came there and looked at going to school there, 
uh, Hickman said, we don't have any money that we can help you with in the School of Music. You should go over and talk to Harry Beecham and see what he has or the band department. I go over to see Harry Beecham. He remembers me because when he was teaching at Wayne State in uh, Detroit, he would come back and hear Cast Tech play. When I was at the University of Michigan, he would go to the University of Michigan concerts and remember that I was playing uh, at one time, uh, well, for the most part in the first cornet section, but at for a length of time, solo cornet in that band. So when I went down and, and said, I'm interested in uh, coming to the University of Illinois and uh, is there, can you give me any help? He gave me a graduate assistantship. I also looked at Northwestern and uh, they said, we'd love to have you come, but um, I had a family. I was gonna have to stop work to uh, work on the degree and uh, the University uh, of Illinois helped me uh, to do that with the least amount of financial pain. But experience-wise, being around uh, Harry Beecham, people uh, talk about him and some they, with some reverence and some fear about what he has done. But on the podium, he was it was all about the music. Always it was about the music. But off the podium, he was as kind or as gentle or as, as thoughtful a human being or person in this profession that I know. We became very, very good friends. Um, and there were insights and there were things that uh, he could do and share with me that uh, I'll uh, be thankful for uh, for the rest of my life. Um, and uh, there's some differences that I would, when I'm gonna compare Ravelli and Beecham. Beecham was a technician from the standpoint that rarely did he make a mistake. Boy, he'd step on the podium and whatever that he was that he was doing, he was so well prepared. And he just had this, and it was this, you, you knew what to expect. Uh, there were generally, if ever, any surprises. Uh, and uh, the technique, and that is something that I took from him as a conducting student. Ravelli had this amazing ability to hear the group. He knew what a large ensemble or what he wanted to sound like. And there, may, there were times where I felt like, as I look back on it, that he always didn't know how to tell us to get there, but he knew what he wanted to sound like and he insisted and went after it to make it sound a particular way. So Ravelli's ears and the ability to understand the possibilities of a large ensemble, and of course the high standards uh, was what I learned uh, when I was in Michigan. What should a band or what can a band sound like? And with Beijing, not just what the band should sound like, but the, the level, the meticulousness, the level of exactness, and uh, the kind of work that it took before you step on stepped onto the podium uh, to make your work as good as it could possibly be is what I took from Beijing. And and is it true that Beijing recorded every one of his rehearsals and then would go back and study the recording? I mean, he was like a football coach, correct? Uh, he, there was a recording booth, and I'm not sure that he recorded all of them, but many of the rehearsals they recorded because there was a booth right inside the rehearsal hall. Uh, I even, uh, when I was working on my doctorate, uh, rented a room out from the gentleman, Eldon Oyen, who did the recordings of the rehearsal. So they would record the rehearsals. I'm sure he went back and listened to them and he would come back in. And of course, as an end result of that, uh, know exactly what he needed to do or what he wanted to work on in day to day. We recorded, I recorded a couple of the March albums. There are two March albums out mm -hmm. in And those albums, we re we come in, they play the chorales that uh, Beijing used, and then we would read a march, we would play a march, and we'd do it for a week. Uh, and after doing it for a week, we'd have, the we'd have the recording session for the march and go on to the next one. So one march each week, so, pretty amazing. You know, in later life, Dr. Beijing would come to Chicago and he was teaching a, a continuing education class with me. And I'd always take him out to my favorite Italian restaurant in Chicago, Tufano's, I've taken you there. And, and and along the way, we would start singing a march, and he and I would sing a march together. And and my my favorite march to sing with him was Washington Gray's, and oh, he loved it. And you know, there's in the middle of it, there's the spot where there's a pause, right? There's a pause right there, right? Yes. So we would be singing, and I would purposefully jump it. I would jump the pause, and he go, no. Oh, no, you forgot to stop. There's a pause. And he and he then he would look at me and go like, you did that on purpose, didn't you? <laughs> and we 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 laughed so much, man. Dr. Beejan was was great. I mean, he was such a great musician, but 
talk about somebody that knew marches. My God, he knew more marches than anybody I ever knew. That's he, exactly right. And if, uh, I actually, there will not be a season that gets to go by where I don't do at least one or two marches. Uh, I love marches. I love teaching them. Uh, I even, they've tapped me now a number of times to do clinics on marches, and I absolutely enjoy doing them. So, yeah, they're great. Part of our history. But well, us haven't had the chance to hear your bands at Boise. I mean, you have done uh, an incredible job there. And how many years have you been at Boise, uh, Marcellus? I came to Boise State University in 1989-90. Oh, my gosh. 30 years. 31 years. That's exactly right. Oh, my gosh. Well, you're getting ready to retire. But, hey, but, you know, you've done an incredible job there. And, and I mean, with no disrespect to Boise, Idaho, because it's one of the most beautiful places on earth. I mean, let's face it, it is not the cultural epicenter of music uh, in the world. I mean, you know, it's, it's not an L.A., it's not a New York, it's not a, you know, even an Ann Arbor, Michigan or a, uh, Indiana or one of those kind of things. So how do you find and how do you develop uh, those wonderful musicians? How do you do that? I think uh, what you have to do is you first don't have limitations when you come in. Don't, don't expect that we can't do something. And then I think you have to take people from where they are and you have to work little by little, step by step to grow them as far or as much as you possibly can. But the goal, and they have to understand the goal is to be excellent. The goal is to be outstanding and to make them, I have them believe that they can be at that place. Uh, and uh, everything from what I learned at Chicago State on how to teach, everything from understanding what a band should sound like and seeing rehearsals uh, when I was in Michigan. Uh, but forget Michigan. Um, let me say that. So when I was in Michigan, they indoctrinated me. A lot of schools do. You go to a school like that and they make you feel like the sun rises and set on the University of Michigan. The sun rises and set on Eastman. The sun rises and set at the University of Texas. Uh, not true. There are great schools all over. There are small schools. There's no reason why a small school couldn't be great. Uh, there's no reason why a kid from the inner city of Detroit uh, can't be an excellent trumpet player or can't be an excellent conductor. So don't have limits. Work at your task daily, honestly, hard on a regular basis. Take advantage. I had to take advantage of all the expertise that I could people around town, going to the Midwest and going to concerts, going to rehearsal. When there were all state or honor band or honor groups that, that happened, go to the, I went to the rehearsal, sat through the rehearsals to see was, were, were there things that they could do that I could steal, that I could pick up, that I could borrow, uh, and then try to incorporate that in my work. And my goal when they hired me at uh, Boise State was to develop a band program that play at the same level as the best schools in the country. Now, it may take us longer to get there at times. We can't do it as fast as maybe a Michigan or as fast as uh, an Eastman. And there may be some pieces, and there are there is literature out there that we'd have a difficult time playing well just because it's technical challenges. But we do play at a very high level, and we play some of the best literature uh, written for our ensembles. Um, the other couple things that I guess I would share with people uh, or have people remember that we have to listen to all kinds of music. It's not just band music. You, you have to listen to orchestral music. You have to listen to uh, country music. I, why is it that a pop singer or a music that, that you hear over the radio speaks to you and moves you one way or the other? And if you can figure out what that is, and, and connect with the students that you're dealing with and have them understand that this is the same thing we're doing with this music that's, in, that's so much different and begin to employ that, I think you can develop, or those are the things that help me to develop a program at Boise State that, I, that has been for a number of years a top quality program uh, in the country. So you've been teaching at Boise for 30 years. You obviously had years at uh, Chicago State and you were at uh, Augustana. Uh, you, you've seen things change. I mean, you've seen students' attitudes changed. Um, do you think their talent levels changed? I mean, you know, what have you noticed different from students now than when you first started? 
I don't think the student or the human has changed, but I do think that the method of learning and how they've learned things have changed. So when they come to us now, 30 years, uh, or when I started 30 years ago or 20 years ago, they come to us set up differently with different methods of learning because of technology and because of social media. Uh, things that were priceless in my development was being in Germany and hearing all those live concerts. Uh, now you can go on YouTube. Uh, you can learn how to do theory on a computer. Uh, you can uh, play along or do uh, record something and record it back. But the understanding of what's musical about it or what makes it musical, you've got to find that by listening and working through on your own. Uh, and so the process that people use to get there is different. But um, the actual student, I think, is the same. Uh, but because of how they come to us, what they how they have learned initially, I think we have to go and begin to teach through those mediums or understand where they are to make ourselves better teachers or make our, give us the ability to connect with them in a way that we can help them find out who the best or how or who the best that they are. So we, so in other words, as teachers, I mean, we better continue to grow right along with them. Otherwise, we're not gonna have any chance in the world to connect with them, is what you're saying. Socially, technology-wise, and listening-wise, too. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, has Cole, has uh, Boise been in a, a virtual teaching time during COVID? Uh, some of the schools have. Some of the schools have not. It depends on where you, depends on where you are. Um, and uh, at Boise State, uh, we, uh, our semester is actually going to start with uh, in-person teaching that starts today. And we'll go through uh, spring break, which they push, push back to the middle of April, but students will not come back. The last couple of weeks of school will be virtual. And actually this past week was virtual. So Boise State is set up so that once we're here, we teach in-person and students have a choice uh, to do it virtually mm -hmm. and to do it uh, in-person. The problem with what we do is that what we, we cannot do what we do as well virtually. It just simply does not work. What we do is designed to be done as a group uh, and to learn as a group. You can't figure out blend and balance by recording your separate uh, excerpt or part of a piece of music, sending it to a recording engineer or a guy that puts it together in a Zoom uh, video and it comes out and sounds good. It, it just doesn't work well. Uh, I can't teach students how to conduct uh, virtually well. It's very frustrating with me. And then because of COVID, you can't walk up and touch it. Uh, so um, what we do uh, to do it well has to be done uh, as a group and with human contact. There's no way to get around it. And we're just gonna have to suffer through it for another, hopefully four or five months or six months and hopefully we'll be better off next year. What's been the reaction from your students during all this time? Uh, some students uh, seem to thrive with it. Uh, I know that they don't like it as well. There are students that being alone and working it individually is ideal for them. Uh, and for other students, that, that's not their method of learning. It has been a struggle. So we've had students that have been in academic trouble uh, because of the, the learning process and the way it is now. And the other thing that concerns, that really concerns me is that there are things that you get in in-person teaching that we've just had to forego or that we've not been able to use or teach. And so students will come out, I believe, over this past year with less or not as well off as they been if they had been to if, if we had been able to do this in person. And when I think about it, there are no concerts. All of our concerts are that we're doing, there's no audiences in the concerts. The public schools in our area have uh, not are not doing any public concerts. It's funny that the football team can meet and play football, but you can't meet as an ensemble uh, or do a concert uh, with an audience if you spread them. If you have a hall, our whole hall seats two thousand people. So could we bring a hundred people in our hall and have them hear a concert safely? If you're careful, you can, but 
at this point, they, the university has said no. And many of the public schools are doing the same thing. Some schools are allowing it to happen in a meeting, but I'm not so sure that that's the right thing to do health-wise. Yeah, well, we got to get those TV contracts where they're going to give us, you know, $10 million a year to do concerts. And then all of a sudden it'd be okay to do those concerts. We know that, right? Follow, follow the money, Marcel. That's right. Follow the money. So you think there's going to be any takeaways once this gets back to normal? I mean, you think there's we're going to, any of these things that we've been doing to, to compensate for not having students face-to-face, the, the distance learning things? You think any aspects of that are going to roll back over into our normal day-to-day teaching? I think so. I think there's, there'll be some aspects uh, of the virtual teaching that we that will employ, that we can employ. Um, some of the aspects of hearing people play and turning in uh, uh, performance uh, tracks or performance etudes uh, that the public schools are using, have been using, we've not, I did not have to use. There's something called Flipgrid that I use now to listen to students play uh, that I didn't use that I think are helpful. Um, I, there's been some pretty amazing things with uh, the technology that's available. It's not terribly expensive. And I've seen some concerts that people have put together. And I say, boy, that's nice. Uh, it's interesting. And they actually put together a concert. I think that it would be better if the groups were able to rehearse together as a group. Because a lot of the groups are what they're doing is they'll have a recording. They'll give someone the music. They play or they record the music along with the recording going on. Uh, and then they put it together, but that's not really making music as a group. You're not doing something special. You're not interacting with the musicians and you can't change things or interact with the audience that way, not in a, a, a significant way. So there will be some technical strides. There will be some things that will be easier and will cost less money because of the technology. And those things are good, but um, I guess I would use the tuner example. You can have a tuner, and have a kid or a student walk in front of a tuner and play a tuner and make it stop on 840 and they're looking at it and it lines up in tune. Now you have them go and play with another person and it doesn't line up because they bent the note with their eyes. So they're tuning with their eyes and not learning and using their ears. And what we do uh, in our profession, it has to do with our ears and it has to do with our souls and it has to do with connecting and making something come uh, out of those notes that are on the page and uh, dubbing on top of recording or listening to recording and playing with, with something that someone else does is not why we went into this business or that's not what attracted me about music. And for that matter, I'd say to anybody that's listening, those folks that are in music and that are connected with music and are doing things in music, they're doing it because they figured out they could create something, that there was something, an intangible that happened when you played your instrument or when you sang a song or when you participated in a group. And that's what hooked us. That's why we're in it. And we can't afford, we can't do it unless we do it live or in a group virtually. So if I'm a, a teenager getting ready to graduate from high school, and I say, man, I want, a, I want a career uh, as a music teacher. I want a career in music. I want to be a performer. What advice would you give them? Praxis, praxis, <laughs> praxis. The first. Uh, the second is listen to great music and great music makers of all kinds. Um, like I said before, it, it, it's jazz, pop, rock, country. You may not listen to it all the time, but if it's, if it's working or if it's speaking to someone, figure out why does it speak to them or what's going on that makes it special. And use your ears and uh, your intelligence and your musicianship to find that and use it in what you do. Um, I would tell people that uh, you have to make strive to be excellent. Try to be perfect. We're not. But you have to strive for excellence in all the things that you do and all the work that you do. Um, And in the process of you trying to do it yourself, uh, you can learn how to share it. Uh, You can learn how to share it uh, 